Please watch this video as Pastor will be at the end of it with some comments and in important information. Thank you. Well, welcome to session five of our incredible journey through the book of Acts. I hope that you are getting as much out of the journey so far as I am. And I am so excited about this session today. We just left breakthrough miracle power. We saw it with the outsiders, with the Samaritans. We saw it with uh, the person who was far off, the Ethiopian who was seeking God. We saw it with the hyper-religious and Saul coming to put his faith in Jesus. And we saw it with that centurion Cornelius, an outcast, someone that you would have never thought had a shot with the gospel, all coming to put their faith in Jesus. As we saw the breakthrough miracle power, now we see that the church is being established. So there's ascending, but then there's also an establishing. Uh, the gospel goes out, remembering the power of the Spirit. Why? So the church can be born. And then the church is strengthened and established, and then the church sins again. So we go and we plant and we build, and then we go and we plant and we build. And that's the story that is continuing until this moment today. In fact, that's what I'm a part of at our house called Passion City Church. It's about strengthening the church so that we can send people out into the world as light in the darkness. And that's the same for you and for me. And today we see something really, really powerful. And that is this, that the church is mostly built by blocking and tackling. I don't know if you're into football or not, but you know, there's the Hail Mary. That's the last second, last ditch play where the quarterback scrambles around, throws it 70 yards down the field. Everyone jumps in the air. The ball might be tipped. And finally, someone comes down in the end zone for a touchdown. And those plays you talk about forever. But they always say that the football game is won in the trenches. That means the offensive lineman and the defensive lineman the blocking and the tackling, that really determines ultimately who's going to win most of the games. And I remember when we were planning Passion City Church, I was 50 years old at the time and already involved in a lot of ministry. And I sensed God saying, this last season of life, I want you to plant and lead a local fellowship of faith. And so I was making that decision. And at the time, I was in another city uh, on a tour with a very well-known worship leader and we were doing an event at a basketball arena in this city and during the day I'd met with a pastor friend there who I really respected as uh, a leader of of the church builders and I told him God's putting it on our heart to plant a church and I'm just looking for advice and someone to mentor me any wisdom you've got and he just looked at me and he said hey Louie what, what you guys are going to do tonight in the arena is going to be amazing. And what you did last night in the city before that and the night before in the city before that, amazing. But that's all touchdown bombs. He goes, that's not church, and you need to know that on day one. Church is about blocking and tackling. And I've never forgotten that. Sure, there are big breakthrough moments. Yes, there are highlight Sundays. Yes, there, we all see the stories where God does something that we consider the miraculous. But in Acts, what we're going to see is that it's both the breakthrough miracle moment and then it's the thousand other miracle moments that you see in the trenches that build up and strengthen the church. And one of those happens in our chapters today. It's the church at Antioch. And this is such an incredible story because you're in this story. So let's back up for a moment and just fast forward again. Stephen is killed for his faith. But that doesn't stop the expansion of the church. It actually propels the expansion of the church. Why? Because the persecution that came after his death made the believers scatter out of the city and they went everywhere and everywhere they went, they carried with them the story of the resurrection. Some of them 
went to Antioch. Now, mostly when they would arrive in these new cities, they would go to the Jewish community and communicate with the Jewish community that Jesus is the Messiah. But in Antioch, something different happened. In Antioch, we saw a leap of faith. In other words, the story of resurrection went from the Jewish community into the Hellenistic community. There were Greeks living in Antioch and they heard the gospel and put their faith in Christ. So once again, a breakthrough miracle moment that these Greeks now are coming to faith. They're coming to know the word of God and coming to know the story of God. This was unthinkable again to the church back in Jerusalem. So they said, we got to send someone to check it out. And they sent Barnabas to see what the story was. He arrives and sees that God is in fact doing a miracle work in Antioch. He says, I got to go get Saul. And so he goes to Tarsus, finds Saul, brings him back with him to Antioch. And then the scripture says that they stayed in Antioch for one year, building up the church, a whole new model of church. Now we have Greeks and Jews who become believers in Christ all together building up the church. That's why if you're reading along and you're new to the story, you're going to go, why is this Saul guy now Paul? And Paul was Saul. And who, who is this and how did that happen? Well, Saul is his Hebrew name and Paul is the Greek name. And so now as the church in Antioch is born, a lot of times people are calling him Paul while some people are still calling him Saul. But you see the beauty now of this ethnically diverse church starting to strengthen, strengthening so much so that it becomes a part of the great sending that has gotten to you and me. So the first thing we see is a leap of faith. The story of Jesus has leaped from the Jewish community into the Greek community, and that's powerful. But we also see, secondly, the power of stay. What does that mean? It means that the church is built by the faithfulness of people. And in our culture, we're always looking for the next thing. We're always looking for another opportunity. We, we want to keep all of our options open. But think about this. These two amazing leaders of the church, Barnabas and Saul spent one year of their ministry in this same church. And day by day, they strengthened the believers there, so much so that it says that the believers were first called Christians at Antioch. I love it because I'm a Christian. People say, you know, what faith are you a part of? And I like to say, I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a Christian. That word was first used of the believers in Antioch, and it was because of the discipleship over the long haul that was invested in them and strengthened this church. So we've seen a leap of faith. We've seen the power of stay. And then in the next chapter, we see a miraculous escape. So God's at work up in Antioch. He's got believers now scattered around sharing the story of resurrection. But meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, the pressure is still on. And Herod has some of the apostles under pressure. And ultimately, Peter is arrested and put in jail. We see this reoccurring theme, right? There's going to be a lot of jail time in the story of the early church, a lot of persecution, a lot of opposition. And in this moment, uh, Peter's put in jail. And the beauty of it is that the king thinks he's got all the power and all the authority. But remember, we talked about in the earlier session that there's a new authority, a new overarching authority that we're moving out with in the world. And so we always know, no matter what the circumstance is, Jesus is Lord. No matter what the situation is, Jesus is still king. And so Peter's in jail, says that they wanted to make sure he stayed in jail. Remember uh, all kinds of supernatural things that happened in the story before. And so during the night, he actually was chained between two guards. They're like, this guy is definitely not making it out of the jail tonight. But during the night, an angel of the Lord came and freed Peter. 
woke him up. He realized that he was free. He got up, walked out, and doors opened, and now he's walking free from the jail. And what he does is he walks right back to the home where he knows the believers would be gathered. And they had gathered to pray for Peter. The Lord's now working to perform a miraculous escape. And as Peter is free, he goes back to the house and he knocks on the door and someone comes to the door and looks and they're like, oh, I don't know who this is and we're scared to death anyway because people are getting arrested. And he keeps knocking and he keeps knocking and they're not even sure that it could be him because he's in prison. I wonder sometimes if our faith needs to be stronger. We're praying for God to do something miraculous and then he does and we're like, well, I don't know. I, don't, I can't even believe he did something miraculous. But here stands Peter and he appears to the people, strengthens their faith that your prayers have been answered. And then he moves on knowing that the pressure is still on in that place. It's just a beautiful picture today that God still answers prayer. We see the tension because he's not gonna provide a miraculous escape every time. This story ultimately ends with Peter, like Stephen and like Paul, giving his life for the gospel. So every single time, the prison doors aren't gonna swing open. They could, God could do anything at any moment. But the plan isn't always for the miraculous escape. The plan is for us to see the power of God, believe that our prayers can be answered, but no matter what, to continue to share the story of Jesus in power, whatever the circumstance and whatever the outcome. So let's go back to Antioch for a moment because there two keys also that I want us to see in this session. And that is that in the church, there's always a mindset of sending. So Antioch, think about it. What, what if you were in Antioch and your story was, we had Barnabas and Saul, who's known as Paul, at our church for a year. What would you wanna do? You'd wanna build a bigger building. You would wanna open new locations. You would wanna get a headline. Hey, we've got the two you know, premier missionaries in the world at our church for an entire year. The focus would be on us, right? But as they were praying and fasting, it says in chapter 13, the Holy Spirit came to these leaders of the church in Antioch and said it would be good for you to send out these two guys on a journey to do what I've called them to do, which is to take the story of Jesus to more places like Antioch. And the church in Antioch sent out Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. And they did it because of the power of stay. So when we open chapter 13, we see these amazing leaders in the church. And what I want you to celebrate with me today is it was a diverse leadership team. There were people of different ethnicities. There were people of different backgrounds. There were people who had had different experiences in life. And some had been connected to those who were persecuting the church. And so this was a beautiful tapestry of humanity leading the church in Antioch. So from day one, the church sending out missionaries into the world was a diverse church, an ethnically diverse church, a beautiful tapestry of the whole world, the place where the gospel was going to go. And they were able to send because there had been the power of the staying. But the staying wasn't about just keeping it all here. The staying was strengthening so that we could send more people there. I just asked that question about my life and your life today. Our are we more focused on getting more for ourselves, more, more teaching, more experiences? Is it all about us? Or are we realizing God wants to make us strong so that we can be a part of not only taking the story further, using our influence and resources to help send the message to more and more people? And then the very last thing we see in this session is the church is all about sending 
but the gospel is always going to find opposition. It's not necessarily because of the people who carry the gospel. It's because of the message of the gospel and the threat it is to the kingdom of the darkness. So Paul, Barnabas, they're on their way. They go to a town called Iconium and they preach in the synagogue. They preach the resurrection of Jesus. They go from there to a town called Lystra and they're preaching again in the synagogue. And it's the Jewish people who rise up against them. Why? Because now there is a Jesus story in the mix. There's a resurrection story. There's a grace story in the mix. And they oppose the story. And I just want to make sure we understand today, they, they weren't really opposing Paul. It says they came against Paul. Yes, they did. And in Lystra, they dragged him out of the city. And like Stephen, they stoned him. But it wasn't that they were anti-Paul. It was that they were anti the gospel, reminding us today, you and me today, that we are in a spiritual war. Paul later wrote to the church in Corinth that those who can't see the gospel, they have been blinded by the God of this world who has covered their eyes and covered their minds so that they can't see the glory of God in the face of Christ. So we're in a spiritual battle. So don't take it personally <laughs> unless you need to. And if you need to take it personally, then maybe you need to work on whatever it is about you or I need to work on whatever it is about me that's annoying the people around me. Let it be the gospel that leads the way. Love people, but preach the gospel. Be a kind of person that people want to be around, but preach the gospel, but know the gospel is gonna find opposition because we are in a spiritual battle. But whatever opposition, don't stop telling people about Jesus. The craziest part of this story is they drag Paul out of the city. They stone him and leave him for dead outside Lystra. But when some of the other believers arrive, they see that Paul's not dead and he revives or wakes up or comes from being unconscious to being conscious. And when he realizes what has happened, you know what he does? He doesn't say, man, this is getting too crazy. I'm gonna have to tap out right here. This missionary journey, this is probably gonna be our last day because I don't really wanna go through that again. No, remember, these men are filled with power. They've been sent out in power. So do you know what Paul does? He gets up and he turns around and he goes right back into Lystra. Can you imagine that? That would be the, the last thing any normal thinking person would wanna do. But the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to overcome any opposition, any hardship, any persecution. And Paul goes straight back into the city with the same message of resurrection that had gotten him stoned in the first place. I love it. I love that that power is not just available to these people that we're reading about today. It's available to you and it's available to me. And I, I wonder where you fit in that story. You know, years before we planted Passion City Church, I was um, approached by some people, my wife and I were, about planting another church in America. And we sensed that maybe God was in it. And we asked some elders in our lives that had spoken into our lives for a long time if they would pray with us about this opportunity. And they were a little ahead of us in age and we, decided to go away for a weekend, the two couples of us, and, and just pray together, seek the Lord together. Is this something that God wants for Shelly and myself to do? And at the end of the weekend of prayer, Shelly and I knew for sure this is not what God wants us to do. We, we love the idea, we love the vision, we love the people, but it's not the step God wants us to take. But at the end of the weekend, interestingly, the couple who was a little older, I wanna say like 55 years old at the time, said to us, as we've been praying this weekend, we believe God wants us to go and to help plant this church in this city. They were also in ministry and at that season of life where no one would have thought of making a move like that. This person had been leading worship all of his ministry life, not planting churches, and they were gonna move from one part of the nation to another part of the nation to join up with a small handful of couples to plant a church and they said 
it's not for you, but it is for us. And they were sent out by their church to plant this church, which I spoke at a few months ago. And now with new leadership in time has thousands of people coming and many, many people who've come to faith in Jesus. Why? Because the church is still sending and God is still connecting and God's still calling. And I wonder if even in this day, if God's saying to you, I, I've been too much about the, the staying and I need to be a part of the sending. Or maybe at the end of the day and the end of this session for you, it's just that you've been thinking about quitting. I don't know what the circumstance was, but it got so hard, so difficult, so painful. You said, I'm just going to cash it in right here. And God's saying, no, you have the power to stand back up on your feet. You have the power to get back up again. For some of you, you, you've got the power to fulfill that calling of going right back into the difficulty that you came from, knowing that God's going to give you what you need. You've got that staying power as well because there's always going to be opposition to the gospel. Let's make sure people are opposing the gospel and not opposing us or our personality. But even in the persecution of the gospel, God's given you the strength today. Don't quit today on the vision and the calling that he has for your life. Thank you for watching and please stay tuned for the next video. It has information on pastor from pastor. Sorry. Okay. I think we're good. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what we just, we just heard, man. There were some good things in there and I, um, that we can really talk about and, uh, and get into. Uh, he covers uh, more than just one chapter and it's something that we need to remember. Uh, that he's covering just more than just one chapter here. Um, so I want to go back to Acts chapter 10. There was something when I read this, it just kind of jumped out at me, and I just want to share it with you. Um, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 30, it says, And Cornelius said, uh, said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. In the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. I want to stop right there and talk about that. Look at what the angel told Cornelius when, uh, when he came to him. He says, thy prayer is heard and thy alms are, are had in remembrance in the sight of God. As I'm just talking about his giving, his, he was a, a generous man and he was giving to the poor and, and, um, and giving to the ministry of God in some way he was given to the ministry of God and so and given to the poor so here's the thing we need to look at first of all this angel is telling him that your prayers and your giving has come up before God as a memorial he's remembering this he's re it's a memorial before God and when I saw that my thought was is my giving uh coming up before God am, am I being generous enough in, in my giving is my prayers. Do I spend enough time praying? I said Sunday that if you don't have a prayer life, you don't have much of a life because it's all about prayer. We've got power in our prayers in the name of Jesus, and we need to exercise that power in our prayer life. Amen. We need to exercise. The, you know, the greatest gift that we have on this planet is the gift of prayer that we can call out to a mighty God and, and he hears us and he answers us and he leads us and he guides us. Prayer is a precious gift, saints, and we need to learn to pray. We need to learn to do more praying, especially as now these last days that we're living in, we're seeing prophecy fulfilled. We know we're on the edge of the rapture of the church and we need to be praying more, praying more for those that we love and making sure that we stay ready for the rapture of the church. So it just kind of grabbed me when I saw that Cornelius' giving and his prayers were like a memorial before God. And he was remembering and, and, and God was remembering this prayer of this Gentile. Now, this is not a Jew. This is a Gentile. Amen. And, uh, and God remembered him. 
And so that just that just really uh, stood out to me. And then Paul goes on here in verse 35. Says, but in every nation, he that feared him and worked righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee, from the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who sent about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Notice he said that ye know. So Peter is, is telling Cornelius, uh, I know that you know this. You know the story of Jesus. You know the story of John the Baptist. Um, so he was telling him, you know, you, you already know this. And this was probably why he was a believer. He was probably a believer in John. He probably heard John preaching um, at the Jordan River talking about repentance of sins. And then he probably followed the teachings of Christ himself. And so he was like a secret the believer. And uh, the conviction of God just couldn't leave him. You know, when, when you're really seeking God, uh, the conviction of God will not leave you. But I want you to go with me to verse 44. Now, we are in chapter 10 of the book of Acts and looking at verse 44. It says, while Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which, which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, which, believe, which believed, were astonished. Now, think about this for a moment. Peter didn't go by himself. He took some people with him. They were Jews. They were circumcised, okay, according to the laws of Moses. Abraham and all that, okay? And so, and they're thinking, you know, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. You got to become a Jew. You got to start practicing Judaism. And that's what they were thinking. There was a huge debate about this in the, in the Jerusalem church later. Um, but so they were shocked when they saw these Gentiles uh, being baptized in the Holy Ghost. They were shocked. And, uh, and that's what it's saying here. So they were shocked when they saw the Gentiles being baptized in the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost fell on them, which heard the word. Amen. Okay. So in verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God, then answered Peter. Can any man forget water? <laughs> I mean, you just, these people are saved. I mean, they not only are saved, but they began to speak in tongues. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost right before the eyes of all the Jewish people who were circumcised and kept the customs and all that. And they're seeing the same Holy Ghost that fell upon them in the upper room, 120 in the upper room. And now they're seeing it falling in Cornelius's house on Cornelius and in his family. And there we go. Can any man forbid water that they should be, they should not be baptized? So if you think there's a formula that you gotta you gotta say a prayer, ask the Lord to come in your heart, and then you gotta go through water baptism, and then the next step is is baptism in the Holy Ghost, and you think that's the order it has to be, this just blew that out of, out, okay? Because there's no order with God. He can do what he wants to do. And if the Holy Ghost wants to baptize somebody when they accept Christ, he can do it before they get baptized in water. But I want you to notice that Paul uh, Peter also told them, can any man forbid water? So they were baptized in verse 48. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So there you go. We got the, re we got the history of what happened at Cornelius' house. It is powerful. So the question is, um, how about your prayer life? Does God hear your prayers? Is it a memorial before God? How about your giving? Your uh, generous giving to God, is it a memorial before the Lord? That's the question. Amen. Praise God. And so that's what we wanted to look at today and to, and to look at that. And, you know, and what he was talking about when he was talking about the persecution of the church, um, man, and, you know, it's not us. Don't take it personal. You know, that's hard to do sometimes. Don't take it personal when people are persecuting you. But it's the gospel. It's the gospel. It's the it's Christ in you that they're persecuting, not you the person. And uh, we have to remember that. Um, that is not about me. It's not about you. It's about the God in you. That's what they're upset about. And and so we have to realize that we are living in a world that is full of demonic influence. Demons are everywhere. 
And um, I, I'll tell you, I'm going to share a little story with you, and then we'll go into our prayer time because we are just about out of time here with our, our Bible study. And thank you so much for joining us in our Zoom Bible study. We're excited about this. Um, anyways, right after COVID happened, we were, of course, we were outside in our parking lot during the COVID time. Uh, they wouldn't let us use our sanctuary. I mean, it, was, it was a big thing uh, that all we all went, you know, went through. Uh, we went, uh, I think it was 16 weeks in the parking lot of the church. Um, and before we got in, we came back into church on Mother's Day. That was our first Sunday back into the sanctuary was on Mother's Day. And there was a time period when we first got back into church. And we're talking about it. And of course, uh, many of us who remember that and lived through that know that there was a demonic force at, at play trying to shut down the churches. But when we came back to the sanctuary, there was a time period where every Sunday there were major dis uh, disturbances. There was uh, um, distractions. Um, I mean, one time, I remember one Sunday, um, the trash can in the men's bathroom was knocked to the floor. And you're talking about echoing through the church. I mean, it just sucked the air right out of the church and just changed the atmosphere. Um, there was other times when the sound system would be popping for no reason at all. Um, there was just weird things happening where there was a lot of noise outside the church, uh, cars going down the highway. There was all kind of things happening. I begin to realize, um, you know, and maybe I'm a little slow, but I begin to realize after a couple of weeks that this was a demonic attack. And I began to bind distracting spirits, uh, hindering spirits. Spirits that just want to make noise, dem demonic spirits that want to hinder the service. Um, and I started binding those, and I've been praying against those, and I still do today. And uh, when I started binding it, it stopped. It, became, it came to a stop. And, um, and so today, every week, I bind distracting spirits, discouraging spirits, spirits that want to cause havoc in the church, um, distract people's attention, uh, get people to not to be able to hear. I bind them. I fight against the demonic world every week uh, before we have service. And uh, and so that's happening. That's something that happened here personally with our church right after COVID. Um, but we just have to remember that we are fighting a demonic world. We are called up. We are called up when we came into this place. We came into this world. We got called up in a heavenly war, an identic war between God and in the fallen angels and so we have to remember that but i thank you so much for staying with us in this bible study and i just want to keep the bible study at 30 minutes um now last week i switched over to the radio station and continued on in our 30 minute prayer but i want to ask you to join me in a 30 minute prayer time and um, i have the book here praying with jesus um and I gave uh, this book out to my leaders. Um, I've had some that said they, uh, some people who are not leaders in our church yet has asked for a copy of it. And so we're going to get that a copy to them as well. This is a wonderful book. It's just the first book that I have ever seen. You know, we talk about prayer and you can teach about prayer. And I have so many times and uh, you can really just jump into God's word and, and dig into the scriptures about prayer. But this book gives you an example of how to pray. That's what I love about this book. It helped you in your prayer life. And if you're and the reason so many people don't pray because they don't know how um, they don't know what to say. Um, spending time in prayer uh, is just foreign to them. And um, I remember for the first time that I, I prayed for an hour, the first time I prayed for an hour, man, it was like, that's the longest hour of my life. You know, it just took forever. Um, but now an hour is nothing. Um, you know, it's just something you have to build into. Something you have to build into. So for those of you who do have this book, and for those of you who do not and you want one, let me know. And I will uh, tell them it's Angel or you want. Okay, but I want you to turn to day 20. Turn to day 20. For those of you who do have the book with me, and that's going to be on page 173. And I'm going to uh, pray, and I want you to pray with me. We're going to just uh, have an example of how to use this book, but we're gonna we're really gonna pray. Okay, this is we're not, just this isn't practice. This isn't um, uh, teaching. 
of how to pray, uh, we're going to do it. We're going to use this book as an example and show us and teach us and uh, lead us. We're going to use this book to lead us in prayer, but we're really going to pray. So I want you to join us right now. Okay. Today's Bible verse. And I proclaim a fast there at the river Hava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all of our possessions. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. That's in the book, that's in um, Ezra chapter 8 and verse 21 through 23. Now here we go with the prayer. Dear God, you are the I am, the covenant God of Israel. We praise you for you are with us. We praise you for the many times that we have prayed and with fasting. You answered our prayers like Ezra. You sought, we sought you out from you the right way for us and for our little ones. And you gave us direction and guidance. And we praise you, Lord, because you hear the prayers of your humble ones. Let's just take a moment and add to that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you for answering our prayers. God, you have been with us through the years, through so many trials and tribulations of life. And even in the things that we didn't understand, God, you were there. Father, you have always been with us. You've always answered us. You've always led us and guided us through the affairs of this life. And we just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us this gift of prayer and giving us the faith that goes with the gift of prayer, God. We thank you, Lord, that we know that when we pray, you hear us, and our prayers are going up as a memorial before the throne of God, as we read in the book of Acts of in Cornelius' house. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're moving right now upon those prayers, that you're dispatching the angels of heaven to answer our prayer, to go forth out and to... Uh, Help us reach the answers to our prayers, to bring things to us that we need supernaturally, whether it be food or clothes or, or gas or whatever it is, God. You dispatch the angels on our behalf, and they fight for us in the spiritual realm. And we just want to say thank you, Lord, for this beautiful gift of prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, with the psalmist David, we sing on page, we're on page 173. And um, we're on Psalms 121, verses 1 through 8. I will lift up the eyes to the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. We will not allow your foot to be moved. Hmm. I like that one right there. Let's hold on to that one. <laughs> we will not allow your foot to be moved, who keep you, who will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep the lord is your keeper the lord is your shade at your right hand the sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night the lord shall preserve you from all evil he shall preserve your soul the lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forward and even forevermore amen amen you know we use that as a prayer Use it as a as a prayer, Amen. You know, I, I thank God, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that that you did not allow our foot to be moved, God. I thank you, Lord, that you hold us steady in Jesus' name upon the rock of salvation. I thank you, Lord, that you never sleep nor slumber. So you're always watching us. You're always protecting us, Father. We give you praise and honor and glory, Amen. Lord God, we come to you in prayer. But first, we sing your praises. The Apostle Paul writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. O oh God, let us sing with grace and let us praise. Let us, let us pray with persistence and faith. O oh Father, we just thank you, Lord. We just thank you, Lord. Lord, I can't help but think about Paul as we were studying in the book of Acts and how he was chained between two soldiers. And at midnight, at midnight, him and Silas, they began to sing praises unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we glorify you, Father. We just 
worship you right now in spirit and in truth. Father, we just glorify you. Hallelujah. How sweet is your name. Lord, I don't know the songs that they sung at midnight hour. But Lord, we can only sing the songs that we can think of and things that we sing in our present day. Oh, just how beautiful. I can't help but think about the song that's coming to my spirit right now. Amazing grace. Hallelujah. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Thank you, Lord. Who saved a rage like me. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the grace. We thank you for your saving grace, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you sent your only begotten son. And Lord, that you, if we were the only person, if we were the only person on the planet, Jesus still would have came and died for our sins. Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the testimony of Jacob who said, Then let us arise and go into Bethel, that we make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me in the way in which I have gone. Lord, you answered us just as you answered Jacob, and we praise you. And we praise you. You know, every chapter in here, uh, I've noticed that he puts the Lord's Prayer in. And uh, and as I've been going over the Lord's Prayer throughout this book, I, I just see more and more in it. And so join me as we go through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debtors as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. Our Father in heaven, just as Jesus instructed us to pray in your name, we honor. We pray for your kingdom will come. We pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we listen to you now so that you will show us the people who need our prayers. Let your Holy Spirit guide our thoughts and our prayers. And so what we're supposed to do now is we're to intercede for those that the Lord has laid on your heart. I'm going to pray for those the Lord has laid on my heart. You pray for those that God has laid on your heart right now. Father, I thank you, Lord. Lord, I ask you to send Christian friends to Bailey right now. Lord, surround her with Christian friends, surround her with the holy angels. Let these Christian friends have more influence in her life than her other friends who do not love you, Lord. Those other friends that try to pull her down and take her into the wrong directions. God, let these Christian friends be strong in Bailey's life and have strong influence over her and lead her to your throne, O oh God. Lead her to your throne. Open her eyes that she can see. Lord, open her mind that she can understand, open her spirit, Lord, that she can receive. Father, I give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Miss Angel's gentleman now. You just said amen to that one too, Miss Angel. All right. Here we go. Now we're going we're gonna to intercede for the poor and the un- privilege like again we're on page 176 in our book praying with jesus amen so make sure you got your book with you and if you don't have one get with miss angel and uh, tell her you want one and she'll get an order for you almighty god we now submit our prayers of intercession to you we intercede on behalf of the poor and the unprivileged in our in our community we think of the children and parents who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. We think of the teenagers who have never been encouraged to pursue an education. We think of the single mothers who struggle to make ends meet 
Therefore, we pray that you will give hope to the poor and the underprivileged. Make them aware of the opportunities that are available and give them the determination to utilize every resource at their disposal. We pray for our society and for our government that we would provide more effective means of raising people out of the cycle of poverty. We pray that those in need who reach out to you, receive Christ and seek your help. We know that you are that you care for the widow and the orphans and the poor and the alien. Help us to create a just, incredible society that honors you and models your kingdom. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for these children that we pick up on Wednesday nights. God, I ask you to encourage them in your word. Father, I, I pray over our teachers that teach these children on Wednesday nights. God, that you would make them solid in your word uh, as a as an oak tree with deep roots, God. Just give them such depthness in your word and, and just strengthen them, oh, Father, in their spirit and their walk with you right now. In Jesus' name, we we pray over the children that we pick up, God, Lord, that we will be able to provide for them a loving environment, a safe environment, an environment that they feel free to be themselves in. But, God, we ask you, Lord, for an anointing to come upon our church, an anointing upon our teachers, Lord, to teach your word and to teach your, teach your children how to follow your spirit right now and how to live a life that is full of joy in the Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray, Lord, for their families. We bind the spirit of addictions and alcohol and drugs and, and abuse right now in the name of Jesus. We bind those demonic spirits that try to afflict these beautiful children, O oh God. And Lord, we ask you to set their parents free, set their grandparents free right now from any addictions of drugs and alcohol, any addictions, Lord, that are demonic in any way, Lord, that try to hold them down. And Father, we just pray for your salvation gift, God, your gift of salvation, Lord, your Holy Spirit, to sweep through the homes, Lord, of these children where they live, keep them safe, dispatch the angels of heaven, and surround their beds, God, and just be with them in their homes and bring salvation to their homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We need to be praying for our children on Wednesday nights. And praying for our teenagers um, that Miss Angel has as well. We need to be praying for them because there's so many things, so many things that come against them. On page 177, oh God, you instruct us to pray and give us today our daily bread. We come to you now for our needs. Hear us, O oh Lord. This is where we're to go to God and and talk about the things that we need. So what, what do you need? You know, are you struggling to make ends meet? Are you struggling to pay the rent or the mortgage, uh, car payment? Um, you know, those needs are important to God. And we need to go to God in prayer and ask God to help us with these special needs. Or, or maybe you're just having a hard time putting groceries on the table. Whatever it may be, uh, paying the light bill, a gas bill, whatever it may be. Maybe you need healing in your body. Um, maybe just need peace in your home. This is a time to go to God. This is a part of our of the Lord's prayer, and He's asking us to to go to Him for our, with our needs and let Him know what they are. He already knows what they are. But he He wants to talk to us about those needs. Let's go to God right now, Father. We thank you, Lord. And we ask you to touch our needs, God. Lord, there's so many of us that. So many of our people, God, that, that are struggling financially, Lord, they struggle to pay the power bill and to, and to put food on the table, God, and balance the rent and the mortgage and, and the car payment and the insurance, God. There's so many things that pull at our people today, God. I feel like Moses standing before Pharaoh saying, let our people go, devil, from the financial grips that they're surrounded in. Father, I ask you right now to send the angels, Lord, and send prosperity. Send the angels right now in your anointing of prosperity, God, upon your people. Lord, that the angels will lead us and guide us to the, the things that we need in our lives, Father. Lord, that you would meet our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, it, it's not our riches. It's not our glory. It's your riches and your glory. And, Father, I ask you to align us. If there's anything 
that we're doing, if there's anything in us that that's preventing us from being blessed, God, that you would bring conviction to our hearts right now and talk to us and let us repent of the sins that are holding back the prosperity and holding back the angels from reaching us and blessing us. And Father, I pray for my church. God, I pray for every tithe payer. Lord, that you would open up the book of Malachi, open up those windows and just rain down the blessings, God. We're not, oh God, we know that you don't want to be robbed from blessing your people, that you yearn to bless us. And Father, I pray right now that you are able to bless our church. I bind every demonic spirit that would come out against our people that would prevent them from receiving your blessings of finances, your blessings of peace and joy and health, God. Let it rain down health into our bodies right now. Let our bodies respond to the word of God, physically removing pain and bringing healing and restoration inside of our organs right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. All right, so this is, this is a wonderful book. This is what I've been talking about, how wonderful this book is. Lord God, we confess that we need help in speaking wisely. <laughs> oh, can we just stop right there? Lord Jesus, help us speak wisely. Oh, we rebuke our tongues from speaking foolishness. We rebuke our tongues from speaking things that do not line up with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us not be gossipers. Yes, Lord, help us. Teach us what gossip is. Arrest us when we are trying to gossip. When the demon of gossip comes, let us recognize that spirit and put an end to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us not to speak without thinking. Yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. Let it go through the filter. Let our words, our speaking, go through the filter of not only our mind, but your word. Let us not speak what does not filter through the word of God in Jesus' name. Help us not speak harshly in Jesus' name. God, Lord, help us to control our emotions, our anger. We rebuke we rebuke the spirit of anger, the, the demonic spirit of anger that gets a hold of people and makes them angry for no reason and keeps them in an upset state. We bind that spirit of upsetness and that spirit of anger in the name of Jesus. And we just release joy that's unspeakable and full of glory into the lives of our people today in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us to weigh our words carefully. Let us speak life and not death. Oh, in the name of Jesus, Lord, teach us. Teach us, Holy Father, that we do not speak death. That those words are stopped before they come out of our mouth. Because Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So let the abundance of our heart be full of life and peace. Let the abundance of our heart be full of joy and happiness. And let those be the sweet words that come out of our mouth and not words of hatred, not words of harshness, not words of bitterness, not words of doubt and unbelief. In Jesus name. Amen. I told you this was a good book, man. This is, so, this is some good stuff right here. Let us bless and not curse. Oh, Lord Jesus. Arrest our mouth from cursing, curse words, speaking curses over people. Oh, arrest us right now in the name of Jesus. Let us only bless people with our mouth. Only bless people with our words in Jesus' name. Let our words be the messengers of health and hope. Lord, that when we speak, there's healing and coming out of our mouth. When we speak, there's an anointing of hope coming out of our mouth. Encouragement words coming out of our mouth to those that hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we believe you will hear and answer these prayers regarding our intercession and our personal requests. We stand on the promises of Jesus when he said, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Lord, we believe this word. We believe this word. This word is difficult for so many Christians, but God, we believe. We are a believer of this word. Whatsoever 
Whatsoever we believe, we will receive in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we believe it in our prayers. We believe the word of God. We believe the power in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, you will forgive us of our debts and forgive, forgive our debtors. We ask you to bring to mind anyone who has sinned against us and give us grace to forgive them. Search our hearts, O oh God, and show us our faults. Give us pure hearts so that we might see you. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that through the Holy Spirit conviction, Lord, that you would begin to bring names to our minds of our people, Lord, that they will begin to realize that they uh, have all against them, that they're angry against them, Lord, and, and they release forgiveness against them right now. It is re release forgiveness. We forgive. We choose to forgive. Lord, many of us don't know how to forgive, but we ask you to teach us how to forgive. Teach us to love like you love Christ. Teach us to love like Christ loves the world right now. Teach us to love others the way you see them, not the way we see them. God, help us in our love walk and teach us to love others the way you love them. In Jesus' name. And Father, you know, this past Sunday, we had to minister to people to forgive themselves. There's so many people that will forgive others and they ask God to forgive them. They, they have a hard time forgiving themselves. And we had to minister to those people this past Sunday. But Father, I ask you, Lord, that you will help us, help the body of Christ, help the Bowden Church of God. Lord, that we forgive ourselves as well as we forgive others in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, this is some good stuff, I'm telling you. Woo, glory to God. Mm, my Lord. My Lord, we this is just tremendous. Tremendous. That's why I love this book, because it helps us in our prayers. It teaches us how to pray and helps us. Amen. God, we pray you will not lead us in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Your strength, we ask you to teach us to walk in your spirit and to live in your spirit. Let's just stop right here. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, help us walk in the Holy Spirit. Lead us by your spirit. It is so important, Lord. We need the spirit of truth to lead us and guide us in this day and hour that we are living in. We do not want to be on this planet without the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us. Holy Spirit, come to our church. Come to our church members. All those who are joining us in the Zoom Bible study and prayer. Lord, we ask you right now for the in the hour of power, Lord, those are hearing the sound of my voice, God, that you will lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Let me check the time here. I think we are almost out of time, amen, and we are. We've got about two minutes left on our time. Now, so let's look here and say so we thank you for our high priest, Jesus. Who can sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you're not leaving us alone. God, we thank you, Lord, that you understand our struggles, you understand our temptations, you understand us. Give us strength, Holy Spirit, that we need in these last days. Strengthen the body of Christ. Lord, teach us, God, to strengthen and power from on high in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray for my church, God, I pray for my church members. I pray for those that are engaged in this Bible study, God, that it will enrich their life. Lord, that you will bless them. We say, we speak blessings in Jesus' name over them. Be blessed, be healthy, be anointed in the name of Jesus right now and receive what you need from the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with me this hour of power um this wraps it up and for this week and um again uh, let us know if you're having technical difficulties uh so many of you are um we experienced uh sunday night we're having technical difficulties simply not understanding how to get on to the zoom meeting so if there's anybody out there that you know let me know that they cannot join us and that way we can get Miss Angel involved in some IT work and get everybody on board. All right. So I will see you guys on Wednesday. Brother Dwayne will be here teaching live in person. 
and we will be with our children. And then this Sunday, don't forget this Sunday, we are having a Christmas uh, play, and this is going to be our Christmas service, and we're going to have a wonderful time. And, brother, we're going to eat. We got Christmas food. We're going to eat, okay? So I look forward to seeing you guys this week. Until then, God bless you, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.